Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to share our research. My name is Cheryl Cowdy, and the title of my talk today is Little White Savages, Discursive Constructions of Settler Colonial and Indigenous Childhoods in Canadian Children's Print Culture. I'd also like to thank Dr. Harris for including York's land acknowledgement in today's panel. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to live and work in Toronto, the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. On Thursday, December 5th, 1889, the Montreal Daily Witness published a story written by Lola Redmond, a young female public school student from Iroquois, Ontario. As the editor explains, the story called A Bend in the St. Lawrence narrates, quote, one of those painful incidents of children who were carried away by Indians, which were much more common in the early history of the United States than of Canada, end quote. In flowery Victorian prose that celebrates post-Confederation Canada's march toward more modern civilization, Redmond narrates the abduction of Willie Forbes from the banks of the St. Lawrence at the age of four years by the Iroquois. Employing the generic conventions of captivity narratives, the story begins with an idyllic settler scene. The Forbes family's, quote, little shanty nestled among the trees, which seemed to smile condescendingly down upon the happy family. The narrative shifts dramatically from description to the perspective of the boy, and the idyll is interrupted when the child finds himself, quote, caught up by a strong arm, his frightened eyes saw above him a sight which clung to him all through his years. The child gave a cry of horror, but was clasped closer. The Indian, hearing the sister called, bounded off like some wild animal with its prey." End quote. The narrative quickly moves ahead 16 years from the shocking abduction of Willie the child to Willie's development into manhood as Lord of the Wilderness a Crusoe for the new nation, who is more Indian than his Iroquois captors. Quote, he is justly the pride of his captors. He it is who shoots the straightest arrow, who captures the most game, and who is in fact their Lord. Just as Willie's coming of age requires mastery of the skills of the indigen, it also parallels the colony's development into a modern civilized nation and the submission of indigenous peoples. Quote, Inch by inch, the Indians were driven back and their happy hunting grounds were confiscated and made to yield to a growing civilization." End quote. Before he is married off by the Iroquois to one of these so-called dusky daughters of, his, of their race, and upon learning the truth of his white origins from the indigenous woman who raised him, the blue-eyed, fair-skinned Willie chooses civilization over savagery. Enraptured by his sublime sympathy with the natural surroundings of the Canadian landscape, Willie resolves to find his white family and his place in the new nation state. Here we see the construction of the white child captive who both is and is not indigenous. Willie's inherently noble British soul responds to the sublime call of nature, even as he perfectly enacts a reversal of Omibaba's mimicry as the indigen to take up his privileged place as the new colonial, culturally hybrid subject. I begin with this short piece as it so obviously engages with the conventional tropes of the civilization savagery binary of colonial literary genres, such as the adventure story, the Robinsonade and the Indian captivity narrative. In his sublime sympathy with nature, Willie embodies all of the trappings of both the noble savage and of the romantic child. This piece also offers evidence of the influence of these genres on the young colonial subjects of Canada. Although little is explained about its female author, paratextual elements accompanying the story suggest a great deal of effort to control anxieties of narrative authenticity concerning stories written by young Canadians. Also accompanying the drawing is, the story is a drawing of the young Lola Redman depicted as a civilized young woman. While it is unclear whether the story is fictional or based on local history, Redmond's narrative reveals the fascination for young Canadian settlers of tropes of indigeneity and the proliferation in their print culture and in the cultural imagination of the figure of the captive white child or little white savage. The white captive has 
long been recognized by scholars as a foundational figure of settler colonial subjectivity in American literature, particularly in captivity narratives. Scholars of American children's literature have also interrogated the function of the figure of the white captive child in nation building. The, ca the captivity narrative has a less prominent history in Canadian literary and cultural scholarship. Yet as Andrew O'Malley has demonstrated, one of the earliest examples of Canadian children's literature, Catherine Partrail's Canadian Crusoes, invokes the captivity narrative when a settler, settler child character is captured by a local nation. The illustration on my title slide and depicted here as well, shows one of the child characters, Catherine, being carried off by members of the Ojibwe nation. Consider another example, another exemplary piece from the Daily Witness, which documents anxieties about racial purity at the turn of the century with a peculiar focus on the figure of the ambiguously indigenous child. Published in February, 1890, this article called Not a Captive reassures readers that the parentage of quote, the little pale face discovered by Mr. Frederick Villiers among the Blackfeet in the Northwest has been verified to be of quote, Indian extraction by a government interpreter who claimed to have seen the papoose at birth. And note that the term papoose is here sub substituted for infant once the child loses her potential status as a white captive child. Moreover, the author goes on to remark that the girl's younger sister is also white skinned, further highlighting a fascination for an indigenous child subject whose light skin troubles markers of race and otherness. My research explores the ideological work of the captive white child as a discursive figuration in post-Confederation Canada, placing this unique figuration of Euro-American childhood in the context of British imperialism and Canadian colonialism, most particularly the implementation of the Indian Act in 1876. Tracing historical iterations of the trope in Canadian children's literature and print culture of the 19th and early 20th centuries, I argue that the captive child as little white savage is an ambiguous discursive construction of settler colonial childhood that radically silences indigenous childhoods, rationalizing the project of cultural genocide that targeted indigenous, child, um, indigenous children, capturing and removing them to residential schools for over a century. Today, I focus my analysis on Emily P. Weaver's novel, The Search for Molly Marling, a compelling example of colonial fiction for young people that employs conventions and tropes associated with the adventure story, the Robinson ad, and captivity narratives. Although she is little known today, Emily Poynton Weaver, 1865 to 1943, was a successful author by Canadian standards of the period. A member of the Ontario Historical Association and a prolific author of children's nonfiction and historical fiction, Weaver shaped generations of young settler Canadians' understandings of the nation's history and of the relationship between settlers and the Indigenous nations of North America. In 1903, her novel, The Search for Molly Marling, was secured for distribution in Canada by Charles Musson under the imprint of his newly founded Musson Book Company. Originally published by the Religious Tract Society in London, the novel reflects the shift towards secularism in RTS publications of the early 20th century, while still embodying a commitment to Christian evangelicalism and a belief in white British racial supremacy. In 1905, Weaver published a Canadian history for, book, for boys and girls, a textbook that was widely used in Canadian schools and in which she summarily represents the history of the new nation as, quote, the story of a long struggle between the French and the English during which the Indians became of less importance, end quote. Despite Weaver's popularity as an early author of children's literature, her work has received little attention in Canadian children's literary criticism and book history, silenced no doubt by her status as a female journalist and as a prolific writer of popular fiction for children. Nevertheless, Weaver's work has much to teach us about the role of children's literature in the creation of a, na of a national settler culture in Canada. 
The search for Molly Marling is compelling for the ways that it participates in simplistic representations of settler colonial relations and for the narrative strategies of ambivalence its Canadian author employs in her representation of settler of two settler girls kidnapped and adopted by the Delaware from infancy. Set near Pitt Pittsburgh in the mid 18th century, the novel participates in many of the conventions of adventure stories, Robinson odds and American um, captivity narratives. It also borrows from a diverse body of historical source material and its fictional account of an English working class hero named Decariot, who travels to the new world to rescue the granddaughter of his employers from her capture by the Delaware. Depicted in the image on the slide is a visual reimagining of a significant historical source for Weaver's book, Colonel Bouquet's redemption of 300 white settlers, including children, following the conflict known as Pontiac's War in 1764. Note the visual focus in this image on the white captive child in Benjamin West's representation. Dick's adventures in indigenous territory during the French wars is the device that secures his transition to the middle classes. He is an orphan who has been taken under the wing of a wealthy mercantilist family in London, the Marlings, who promised Dick that he will be recognized as their legal son and heir upon his return with their long lost granddaughter. The wilderness journey thus represents for Dick a kind of spiritual and material redemption that is a hallmark of both the Robinson Odd and the captivity narrative. Upon their rescue by Dick Harriet, Violet Eyes and Sun in the Hair, the two female characters, are compelled to engage in a contest of English civility that will determine which is the true long lost Molly. The contest demonstrates the imbrications of colonialist, racist, and patriarchal ideologies in the foundation of Canadian nationalism. The girls' acceptance into English civilization is determined in large part by their ability to mimic English dress and moral behavior, as well as their ability to speak English. Dick first meets Sun in the Hair after he is captured by the Delaware himself. Although she physically embodies whiteness with her blue eyes, fair hair, and skin, her zealous torment of the English prisoner in her charge leads Dick to call her the little white savage. Her menacing mimicry of wild behavior and her cruel torment of Dick complies with discursive constructions of indigeneity as wild and savage. For instance, consider this description of Sun's torment of Dick in the ways she and the other indigenous children engage in an activity that seems to conflate their menacing behavior with a savage form of play. Sun in the hair is frequently described laughing or singing her wild Indian song further constructing her discursively as a wild and uncontrollable child. When we first meet her, she speaks no English, suggesting that she is beyond Dick's civilizing efforts. As an adult captive explains to Dick, that child, whoever she is, was brought here so young that she has forgotten her name, her parents, and her mother tongue, to all intents she is an Indian as much as any child born in the camp." End quote. Her Indianness causes Dick a great deal of affective trouble, in particular his feelings of revulsion and, and disgust. In contrast, when Dick encounters Violet Eyes, she so thoroughly embodies Englishness that Dick has difficulty believing the two girls have shared the same upbringing. Quote, she too was white skinned and fair haired, and her eyes were of so bright a blue that Dick was quite sure that she was Violet Eyes. She was a little taller and much prettier in his opinion than Sun in the Hair, end quote. Violet Eye's mimicry of discursive indigeneity is coded as more gentle and genteel in the text. She has learned to speak English from the cat of adult settlers in the camps, and she embodies the more positive qualities associated with the noble savage trope. Violet's silence and her knowledge of survival contrasts with Sun's wildness, singing and laughing. She is proud of her abilities and she enlists them to lead Dick out of his captivity. Yet she also desires to become an English lady, professing, I always knew I was not an Indian even before Mrs. Freeland came to the camp and taught me to speak English. It is Dick's own education while in the colonies that offers a clue to the novel's pedagogical mission. 
In order to become a sage educator and a man worthy of formal adoption into the Marling family, Dick must experience a spiritual conversion entailing the effective transformation of his disgust and revulsion into pity for the, quote, little white savages under his fatherly care. Dick experiences only a brief moment of conscience in which he questions whether he is right to, quote, force her, son in the hair, to go with him if she did not wish, end quote. This moment of cognitive dissonance is quickly glossed over, but it does ha haunt Dick's pursuit of the girl with the semantic difference between rescue and capture. Who is really capturing whom in this so-called Indian captivity narrative? As foils, the girls represent a composite discursive construction of the captive white child, yet they also represent the unrepresentable, the indigenous child. Colonial discourses in Canada constructed and legislated indigenous peoples as children, thus rendering the, ind the indigenous child an impossible construct. Published only 27 years after the Indian Act of 1876 enshrined the government's control over status rights, especially for women, and legislated the institutionalization of Indian residential schools in Canada, the novel participates in the colonial project of assimilating Indigenous populations by taking, quote, the Indian out of the child. Uh, it has been argued that the Indian Act effectively treated Aboriginal people as children, a homogenizing and paternalistic relationship. To quote the 1876 Minister of the Interior, the Indians must either be treated as minors or as white men. Together, Violet and Sunny stand in for the silenced Indigenous child, and by this logic are both the little white savage and the enculturated, educable child capable of assimil assimilation, however resistant. Narratively, the mystery of the girl's origins must be solved in order to assure the true Molly receives all the rights and privileges of her race and class. To determine this, the girls are put in display before a community of settlers who knew the Marlings and who are anticipated to correctly identify the proper signs of both whiteness and of Englishness. Not wishing to advantage one over the other, Dick has them dressed in the same simple garb. An obedient subject, Violent enters the contest silently and demurely. Conversely, when her double enters, there was a succession of screams, then Sun in the Hair dashed into the room with her long locks fly like flying loose and a patchwork quilt of marvelous design clutched round her shoulders. Stamping her little bare foot, she began to tell him some long tale in her familiar Indian. Curiously, in spite of Sun in the Hair's wild and virus, vociferous display of indigeneity, and despite Violet's ability to more properly mimic English civility, the community is unable to reach a unanimous decision. Dick determines to bring both girls back to England with him on a ship named, ironically, the Mohawk Queen. The ship's name highlights the novel's seeming ambiguity in relation to discursive constructions of the colonial subject and of indigeneity. Throughout their journey to England, and even once the trio arrives safely in London, Sunny Hare, as she comes to be called, is permitted a surprising degree of license to continue resisting Dick's efforts to civilize her. Yet, when Dick begins a program of teaching the two girls to read, Sunny proves to be the quicker scholar of the two. Such hints lead to the novel's dramatic resolution of the mystery. Spoiler alert, Sun in the Hare turns out to be the long lost Molly. Under Dick's tutelage, the little white savage completes her transformation into the transcultural Mohawk queen and can safely take her place in the racial and class hierarchy as the inheritor of the Marling family's wealth. Despite the many signs in the novel that hint at Sun and the Hare's inherent Englishness and racial superiority, her ability to fool readers and colonists as a successful mimic of indigeneity is key to the novel's ambivalence. As Sarah Deleu argues, the power of colonial discourses to form indigenous peoples likely lays in the amorphous nature of discourses. In contrast to the white child captives of American captivity narratives who must, quote, transform themselves from powerless, tender, and suffering innocent children into bicultural, culturally rich adults, and that's according to a 
Eli uh, Elise Mary Anstras. Sun in the hair is permitted a degree of resistance that must be naturalized and co-opted to rationalize the capture and education of indigenous children by the Canadian state. Molly never leaves England, nor does she give up her wild ways once she marries a rich London merchant. The novel ends with the surety that the Mohawk queen dies a, lo a loyal British subject. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to our conversation today.